Attack. Fraser Kane, I have a question I want you to answer. Battlefield 1 or Call of Duty Infinite Warfare? Battlefield 1. Anil Urtuk. What would happen if the nearest stars to us went supernova, but not the sun? If a star goes supernova, it has to really be within about a few dozen light years to cause us any damage uh, to the Earth. So there's no stars that are within that range that are likely to go supernova, so we're going to be fine. The only risk that we would have is if there was a really massive star that's going to turn into like a gamma ray burst, and then it could be halfway across the Milky Way. But once again, there don't seem to be any of those super massive stars that have their poles directed at us, so we won't get that sort of laser beam uh, detonation that that sends the death ray right at Earth. So from what we can tell, we're, we're safe. The only like, possible candidate is a star called WR104, and it seems to be it's, it's not directed at us, so I think we're gonna be fine. But if a supernova did go off that close to the Earth, it would like scour off our ozone layer, and so we'd all get really bad sunburns. So we definitely don't want a supernova to go off really close to us. Michael Gusevsky. Hey Fraser, I recommend you try and hit 10 minutes on your videos. Thanks for the suggestion. I'm definitely aware that doing longer videos that people like to watch is a good thing for YouTube. So we do, I mean, when we started these videos, they were about three minutes long. Now they're closing in on about seven minutes long. I'd be happy to make them 10 minutes long, 20 minutes long. Uh, you have to let me know if you want me to go into that level of depth, if you'll stick around and watch it, or do you prefer shorter videos? We do the Weekly Space Hangout, and that's more like an hour long. We do these question shows, they're about 15 minutes long. But let me know in the comments whether you would prefer a mix of shorter episodes and stuff that's longer. Chris Blackman, what are the odds of Voyager 1 or 2 finding or passing Planet 9? Voyager 1 and 2 are on the trajectory that they're going to be going on for the, the rest of the time they're going to be around. And we still don't even know where Planet 9 is. Space is gigantic. And so the chances that the Voyager spacecraft are anywhere near Planet 9 is infinitesimal. It's only when we actually discover the location of Planet 9 and then send a spacecraft there to intercept it are we going to get a chance to actually get some pictures up close. Remember what happened with New Horizons. We were getting better pictures of Pluto from Earth, from Hubble, until literally just a couple of weeks before New Horizons got to Pluto. You've got to be really close to these objects to be able to get a good view of them. So the chances that the Voyager spacecraft are anywhere near or could be shifted to go near Planet Nine are essentially zero. David Schaefer, what's a Celsius? Please be more considerate of your southern neighbors. Yeah, I'm Canadian. And, and I was raised in the metric system, I literally don't understand what Fahrenheit is. And my wife's American and she says, oh, it's 80 degrees out. I don't even know what that means. Does that, is that warm? Is that cold? Is it, do I need a coat? Shorts? I'm so, so I apologize. I have no idea. And so I literally have to look this stuff up and put both numbers in. But I'll try to make a, an effort to put both metric and imperial when I mention things. Me, myself, and I. What if the galaxy is teeming with life, but there's some kind of galactic association formed of civilizations, and the association decided that they cannot reveal their existence to primitive species such as us until we are able to achieve interstellar travel? This is one of the responses to the Fermi Paradox, this idea that we're living in this galactic zoo. And I don't really find that it's that compelling of an argument, because we human beings here on Earth do lots of different things. Some people want to watch YouTube videos about space, other people don't. Uh, and so I can't really imagine that all of the alien civilizations would get organized about this. You might have some alien civilizations that, that don't want to interact with the life forms at all, and then you're going to have other civilizations that do want to. You're going to have Captain Kirk on the Enterprise who wants to go down and break the Prime Directive and, and meet the local Earth girls. So I think that, you know, for me, even if there was some kind of galactic federation, there would be examples of people trying to, to break through and trying to reach out and, and contact us. So I don't, I don't find that argument super compelling. Geppetta. Can we build a telescope that can actually see the universe before the Big Bang? Unfortunately, the very edge of what we can see is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And this is the afterglow that's left over from the Big Bang. It's about 300,000 years after the Big Bang happened, and it's the moment when the universe had cooled down to the point that light, that, that light could even escape. And so when we're seeing in all directions this cosmic microwave background, 
it is the light, the first light that was possible. And so we just can't see beyond this point. We can't see to the Big Bang, and we definitely can't see past the Big Bang. D Pink. I sometimes wonder why everyone on this channel is so obsessed with alien life. The life on this planet is pretty amazing. I'm not surprised that people on a YouTube channel that's all about space exploration and the search for aliens are really interested in alien life. It seems like a natural fit to me. Uh, there's lots of places where people aren't interested in alien life. But, you know, why are we sort of scientifically interested in, in alien life? Because it really answers one of the most important scientific questions that we could possibly ask, which is, are we alone in the universe? If we are, right, if we are alone in the universe, then we are the only living creatures in this entire universe. And the universe itself has, you know, the, our sun is going to heat up the earth to the point that it's gone in about a billion years. And so life would have started, existed, and then been destroyed forever in the entire universe, which seems like a tragedy. So if there are, is there, if there is other life in the universe, then who are they? What are they like? How did they get formed? Did they evolve like us? Are they related to us in some way? It's some of the most interesting questions we could, prob you know, we could possibly ask. So we're absolutely fascinated with it. There's lots of life here on Earth. We see it all around us. I can hear fish going right past me right now. No problem. Why not look for other life as well? George Conowitz, do you think we should colonize the moon so we build giant telescopes of all the different wavelengths on the dark side? Hey George, you said dark side, but really there is no dark side to the moon. There's only the far side of the moon. The moon, all parts of the moon are in light or in shadows based on the course of its day, which is also its month. But, uh, but the far side of the moon is a great place for us to build radio astronomy uh, observatories because it is in, in shadow from the Earth's radio electric spectrum. So we've got all of this, these signals that are coming off the Earth and they're going out into space in all directions and that really gets, you know, it corrupts what the various radio telescopes on Earth can receive. But if you were able to put a radio telescope on the far side of the moon, it would be able to be in complete shadow from all those signals from Earth. And it's a terrific place to put a radio observatory. People thought about other observatories too, maybe put some visible observatories on the moon. You don't necessarily need to put them on the far side of the moon at this point. You know, if you did, then you wouldn't have the Earth in the way. But uh, there's, and you know, having low gravity on the moon, there's some really neat ideas about taking, um, a mercury, a pool of mercury, and then rotating it so that it goes into the shape of a parabolic or a spherical mirror, and you would actually be able to turn it into a gigantic telescope. And you can only really do that on the moon where the gravity is very low and there's no atmosphere to cause friction. So there's some really great ideas about building telescopes on the moon. Problem is, they'd be on the moon. So they're really hard to get to, hard to fix, hard to upgrade, things like that. So, so it's, once we have permanent human colonies on the moon, we should totally use them for uh, build observatories there. Robert A. If you were given a billion dollars US to spend on astronomical pursuits, what would you spend it on? A billion dollars isn't very much. I mean, we could send one spacecraft somewhere. Maybe we could send an orbiter to Pluto. I know, uh, the New Horizons folks would like that. So I'm gonna need more money. Maybe 10 billion, 100 billion. If you can be 100 billion, now we're talking. So I would probably, what I, I guess, what I wanna do is I wanna answer the question is are we alone in the universe? I want to build the Terrestrial Planet Finder, a telescope capable of observing the atmospheres of other worlds orbiting other stars. If we can do that, then we can find pretty much concrete evidence of whether there's life there or not in this sort of larger and larger sphere around the Earth. And I would spend as much money as you would give me on building the most powerful and sensitive telescope, some kind of coronagraph to to block the light from the sun so we could image the atmospheres of the planets. That's what I want to know. That's what I would spend the money on. Money, please. Sabino Rodriguez, what do you think space warfare will be like? The biggest part about space warfare is that you use space for information, for intelligence gathering, for communications. So all of the countries of the world have some kind of space warfare capability. All the ones who have satellites 
at the same time are probably thinking about ways to protect their satellites and to knock down other people's satellites. How do you do that? Chinese have tested rockets that actually would take out satellites. So you can assume the Americans have got these as well. And the other thing is, is that the Americans, the US Air Force, has an enormous space program uh, that's almost as big in scale as, as the civilian one. They, they have their own sort of version of the space shuttle. They have reconnaissance satellites. They recently gave two telescopes to NASA that are like Hubble-class telescopes because they didn't need them anymore, which is kind of amazing, kind of scary. So unfortunately, space warfare is already in the works, I think, but it's mostly going to be about protecting or taking out the satellites that the nations on Earth use to, to uh, sort of observe each other and to navigate around on the planet. Ancient fairy tale. What would happen to the tides on Earth if there were two moons? If you had two moons, then you would have more complicated tides. Right now, we have two high tides and two low tides a day, and that's just because of the way the moon is going, uh, the way the Earth is turning, and as it relates to the gravity of the moon. And then, because we have the moon's gravity and we have the sun's gravity, sometimes those line up and we get larger tides or lower tides. And so, if we had two moons, then we'd have even more interactions, right? We would have times when those two moons were lined up. We'd have times when those two moons were on opposite sides of the Earth, and that would cause different kinds of tides. If a star goes supernova, it really has to be within a few dozen light years to cause us any damage. And we know. <laughs> Let me try that one more time. Oh, he got away. <laughs>